so much for coming today. Uh, this is our first ever live episode recording of Dare to Disrupt, a podcast about Penn State alumni who are innovators, entrepreneurs, and leaders, and the stories behind their success. I'm Katie DeFiori. I am the executive producer and editor of the podcast, and I'm so excited to be here today with all of you for our first ever live episode recording. <laughs> Startup Week powered by PNC Events. I want to thank the Penn State Small Business Development Center for partnering with us on this event as well in celebration of National SBDC Day. Uh, if you're a small business owner seeking no cost consulting services and programming, I highly recommend you connect with the Penn State SBDC. Uh, so be sure to check them out. I'll kick things off by introducing our podcast host and then he will take it from there and introduce our guest. Our Dare to Disrupt podcast host is Ryan Newman. Ryan is a managing director at Goldman Sachs, where he co-founded and co-leads a private wealth management team, managing more than $13 billion on behalf of Fortune 500 executives, Forbes 400 families, entrepreneurs, family offices, foundations, and endowments. Ryan earned his Bachelor of Science in Economics with honors in 2001 from Penn State, where he graduated first in his major and was student marshal at graduation. He and I launched this podcast together in 2021, and it has achieved well over 50,000 downloads to date. So be sure to use the QR code on the screen before you leave today to follow and subscribe to Dare to Disrupt wherever you listen to podcasts. And I'm going to return over here, press the record button, so that Ryan can start the interview. Okay, we're good to go. This is Dare to Disrupt, a podcast about Penn State alumni who are innovators, entrepreneurs, and leaders, and the stories behind their success. I'm your host, Ryan Newman, and on the show today is Justin Rosenberg. Justin is the founder and CEO of Honeygrow, a fast, casual stir-fry and salad restaurant chain founded in Philadelphia in 2012. With over 40 locations across the Northeastern United States, Honeygrow is committed to enriching the lives of its employees, its customers, and its surrounding communities. Justin graduated from Penn State in 2004 with a degree in history. This is a first for us, Justin. This is the first time we've had a guest who's innovating within the restaurant industry. It's also our first live Dare to Disrupt podcast interview. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm flattered to be here. Thank you, Ryan. <laughs> well, Justin, I'd like to start where we always do, which is at the beginning. Can you give us a sense of sort of those early years when you were growing up? Where were you and what was those early experiences like for you? Yeah, um, well, I was, I guess, 25 minutes east of you growing up in Long Island. So I was in uh, the Melville area, exit 48 on the LIE. Um, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do with my life at all. I was a big musician, played sports. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And actually, the only school on the planet that I really wanted to go to was UCLA. And <laughs> I visited, I was like, oh, I can go out here in LA and surf and have the best time. My parents were like, there's no effing way. You're going to UCLA. Um, I visited Penn State, kind of begrudgingly, to be honest with you. I, was just, I wanted to be in California so bad and fell in love. I'm like, wait, this is awesome. Like, I want to come here. So went to Penn State, lived uh, 714 Curtin Hall, was where I was back in uh, 2000. I graduated in 04, but um, had a really wonderful experience. And I was a history major, Spanish minor, zero clue what I wanted to do. And when I talk to a lot of folks who are undergrads, not really sure what you want to do, how many people here know what they want to do? What do you want to do? Sports, social media, content. Okay, all right. Well, I was like everyone else, and I had no clue. <laughs> and um, I graduated Penn State. Uh, I met my wife at Penn State, actually, at the East Fairmount Efficiency. I don't know if it's still there. I assume it is. Um, she was my next door neighbor. We started hanging out. We started dating. When we graduated, she's from Philadelphia. She's like, come move to Philadelphia. I'm like, you're out of your mind. I'm from New York. Any New Yorkers here? All right. <laughs> Any Philadelphia people here? Yeah. There you go. Where in Philly are you from? Uh, South Jersey, Morristown. You don't count. Where are you from? <laughs> You're really Philly. OK. <laughs> there you go. Well, I have friends in Morristown. You ever go to Pasarellos? Absolutely. That's my joint. Yeah, it's good. Um, so I moved to Philadelphia begrudgingly. And uh, <laughs> when I'm getting a job at a chocolate factory in South Philadelphia, really enjoyed it. Then I got into real estate because it had a really cool opportunity. Eventually worked for a company called Pennsylvania Real Estate Investment Trust um, in Center City, Philadelphia. Got my MBA in finance at Temple, and honestly just really wanted to start my own business during that process. So I want to go back to the beginning. You've given us a lot there, but we always like to understand what some of those early drivers were yeah. 
almost like the pre-seedlings before the real seed was planted that says, I want to be a founder, I want to be an entrepreneur. So take me back to Long Island. You yeah. mentioned you're a musician, you mentioned your interest in sports. What instrument did you play and how, <laughs> what were your music, musical exploits that you had? Yeah, so um, big guitar player um, at a band, I was a lead guitar player, a lot of like blues, funk, punk rock. Um, there is a freedom when you play music. There's a beauty when you're with a band and like, it's the same thing with team sports. It's like, so I'm actually a big Sixers fan. Um, I converted, I'm sorry, but you know, when you have kids, that's what happens. Uh, I love that team dynamic. I love the freedom of it. I love relying on people you can trust. I love winning. And there's something about that in music and sports. So for me, that was kind of like part of it. And my family, they're entrepreneurs. So my great, great grandfather started a business in Lower East Side Manhattan in the 1880s. And it was, they were literally coopers. They were making wooden barrels for like pickles and stuff. In the 20s, they moved to Brooklyn, to Greenpoint, and uh, my grandfather ran it, my father ran it. And as a kid in the summertime, in between semesters at Penn State, I worked for my dad in Brooklyn, loading steel drum you know, trucks and doing the deliveries in the five boroughs. And I just, in my brain, it was like, I could, there's two roads I can go down. There's my mom, who was a teacher, and she te taught at Seifer High School, and that's what she wanted to do, and that's great. And there was my dad's path, which was more, I have the freedom to really build and scale a business. And I found that really exciting. And uh, to be honest, you know, another kid from Long Island, Jewish kid, it was like, you're either a lawyer or a doctor, so pick one. My parents were very much become a lawyer. Part of the story, I remember I took the LSAT here at Penn State. I bombed it. I barely studied for it. My, I remember my car got towed at, during the test. But um, I just, I, I'm not wired for that. My passion really is that exciting people. I like seeing people happy. And the idea of building and scaling something is what gets me out of bed. So it's fair to say you had an early inkling of what being an entrepreneur or an entrepreneurial journey could be like, and you were able to see that both in your grandfather and your father very early on. For sure, yeah. But in some ways, you were also still fighting that temptation, given the societal pressures to sort of do something more conventional, like be a lawyer one day. Yeah, I think there's that feeling of safety and security. I interned a law firm in Manhattan. You know, it was kind of like, you get, you're a lawyer, you make a good salary, and you live your life. And I remember like photocopying a stack of things, being like, this is horrible. <laughs> like, like, this is the saddest feeling. And to be honest, when I, went, when I was working corporate for about six, seven years before starting Honey Grow, I kind of had that same feeling. I'm like, you know, like, I don't feel excited. Like, I don't, the, the company was great. They own shopping malls. Um, but I don't know, like, there's something about being out there and scaling and building it, your hands on stuff, and, and creating a life short. Like, I'm already 42, I graduated yesterday, right? It was 2004, it feels like I just was here. And um, you know, before I know it, I'll be in my 70s, hopefully. Well, not too fast, but I'll hopefully get there. And I don't wanna look back on my life and be like, fuck, I didn't do what I wanted to do. Excuse my language, sorry. <laughs> so you, you're in Long Island, you're lead guitarist on a band, you're watching some of these examples of your parents with respect to, yep. especially with respect to entrepreneurship. You're also in the back of your mind thinking maybe I need to do something more conventional. You really didn't want to go to Penn State. You, you get planted here in State College. What were those early experiences being in State College, being in University Park like for you? It's probably inappropriate for this podcast. Um, <laughs> I'll be honest, like I pledged a fraternity. I got here, I partied my butt off. I'm sorry, everyone just being honest. You guys, I wouldn't be sitting here today as in like the audience. I wouldn't even think to come to this. I would be, what is it, two, almost three o'clock on Wednesday. I probably am not drinking yet, but um, no, I mean, look, I, I got here not knowing what I wanted to do. I was, I was undecided, I was a psychology major, I was a business major, I, was, I didn't have a freaking clue. And eventually I settled on what I enjoyed, which is reading and history, and I felt comfortable there, and I said, all right, I'll pursue this. Um, so I went to liberal arts road, but my, I mean, look, my freshman year was, I was rushing, then I was pledging fraternity here. Anyone from Delta Chi? Anyone know anyone in Delta Chi? <laughs> oh, really? That's awesome. Not here, okay. Brad, I know. TikToker. No. <laughs> is he a big TikToker? Yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> is Delta Chi considered okay these days? I don't know. I think he's probably top five. Top five? I was, I was not. <laughs> I was like, it was like where New York kids go. It was like, it was like whatever. Um, I, I, I had a lot of fun. And I remember I, I graduated high school. I was senior class president. I was you know, honor society, blah, blah, blah. When I graduated Penn State, I remember like, I had to play catch up to get my grades back up because my first two years, I just had too much fun. So 
I had to work hard those last two years. So let's talk about that for, yeah. for a, mar a part if we can. You know, you're, you're in high school, you're class president, you're playing the guitar, you're playing sports, and then you get to Penn State. Is it, was it, do you think, looking back in hindsight, was it kind of the temptation to just sort of sit back and enjoy yourself? Or was it arguably maybe a lack of purpose driving you to want to work harder because you didn't know what you were working for? You should be a therapist. Like, these are great <laughs> questions. Like, I've never thought about this, to be honest with you. Um, I think it was the latter, actually. I, I think I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I felt like I'm here. Um, I probably was bummed I wasn't on the West Coast. Um, and I got like, I just, had, I just started having a good time. And then I got sucked into having a good time. And then I realized, I'm like, crap, I don't have a good GPA. I really need to get this back up. And my personality is, you know, high performing A type human being. So it was very unlike me during that period of time. I remember my mom freaking out, like, what are you doing? She'd visit my fraternity house. Like, the floors are sticky. Like, what is going on here? I'm like, well, but uh, I think my junior year, I really put it back into high gear. And by my senior year, I was, I was just super serious with it. I was just like, I really want to, like, I started going more to different events on campus. Really, like I, I discovered how great Penn State was a little too late. And when I come back now, it's like, man, like I want my daughter, who's 15, she's talked about last night. She's like, I love to go to Penn State. Like, there's so much here that I didn't take advantage of, which looking back is frustrating. But yeah, no, it's good stuff. So you find some semblance of, of if not purpose, at least a desire to want to really apply yourself. You clearly have tremendous talents and skills. And as you leave Penn State, what was your first experience or four-way into the professional world? Uh, back to the photocopy. Yeah, for sure. So that was interning. My first, like, I graduated Penn State. Um, my girlfriend and I, who's now my wife, had a whole debate in New York or Philadelphia. She won, moved to Philadelphia, thinking it was temporary, and got a job at Frankfurt Chocolate. And so they, they actually import, um, like, Nickelodeon, Mattel stuff into the States, distribute it to Wawa, different companies. Uh, really cool company, but my I started like really being interested in like like real estate. I'm like okay, like development, entrepreneurialism, and that eventually led me to apartment acquisitions, and then it, that eventually led me to uh, pre. So you find yourself getting interested in real estate. What was it about real estate that excited you or interested you? I think it was the entrepreneurialism of it. I think the idea of like you know scaling something, building something from scratch. You know how do you monetize it? There was something really exciting about that. And then it kind of, I drifted towards restaurants. And to be honest, at one of the restaurants I was just talking about before, um, Green Bowl on Beaver Avenue, was kind of like the genesis of Honey Grow. So I used to go there all the time back in the day. It was a create your own stir fry concept. Now I think it's more of a Chinese restaurant. It was like nine bucks, all you can eat, throw pineapples and noodles in a bowl with a sauce. We would go there all the time. And I remember thinking to myself, like, how do you like take that and like scale it? <laughs> so when I was a pre, I was thinking like the real estate development's fun. I like food, I like you know, hospitality, it's just more my angle, more my passion. How do I take something like this, no one's really doing anything like this, um, and scale it? So you're, you're at Pre, and you're, um, what were your, your portfolio responsibilities initially, right? So before you actually, you, you got exposure to enough to know that maybe there's a business idea here, but what were you doing day to day at that real estate company and just give us a sense of what your sort of portfolio responsibilities were. Yeah, so it was an asset management. Um, we would oversee, I had oversight of about 18, 19 malls around kind of like the East Coast, uh, Northeast, and actually down South, I would be underwriting deals. So if you want to put a Barnes & Noble into a mall and you have to relocate seven tenants, like how does that work? How does it compare to budget? Doing the capital forecasting, doing the budgeting, um, reforecasting, and deal approval for any of the malls. So you're in this role, and now, and now talk to us about that moment of inception where you're thinking, I actually want to become an entrepreneur. You know, was it the idea of wanting to become an entrepreneur before the actual business itself took hold, or was it the business idea itself that then led you to say, this is worth taking a risk for being, becoming an entrepreneur? Yeah, I think I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. I think I, I just knew like, I didn't have enough skill set. I graduated with a history major, which would have been great if I wanted to teach or go to law school um, or go to school again. Like, I just knew I didn't have enough of a skill set on the business side, which led me to push myself to get jobs out of my comfort zone in finance, and I got my MBA in finance thinking like, I don't know anything about this, I need to figure it out, and I enjoyed it. Um, but I'd say by, by 2008, I really felt like, I was 26, I'm like, I think now is the time to try. And I gave myself uh, three years to get funded to do it, and I said, if I can't do this, 
I'll move back to New York and be in finance and be okay. What's really remarkable is that 2008 yeah. was the year you decided <laughs> to choose a job. For, for those of our listeners who may be on the younger side, that is basically the start of the global financial crisis. Yeah. And so, and you can't say that you weren't aware of what was going on because you got an MBA in finance. So. Well, I was looking at the pre-stock price every day. It was like <laughs> scary, you know. So. Uh, how, how were you able to overcome the fear of the uncertainty in the economic environment and the macro environment to say, now's the time to try and start this? Um, I just am crazy. <laughs> I just was like, like, I don't know. Like, I just was like, now's the time. We just had our first daughter. Um, you know, I kind of felt like things were rebounding a bit by 2009. Like, I just, I had faith that we, we would get through it. And I figured I'll pitch as many human beings as possible with this idea. And if I run out of steam or reach the end of 2011, I'm done. Like I tried, I gave it my all. I will never look back and be like, well, I should have tried to do that. I did it, right? And it led to me pitching 94 human beings over that period of time. It was a very humbling period. So if you, you want to raise money for a business, write a business plan, part one. Wrote a business plan, knew how to do that from business school. And uh, a lot of people, when you're pitching them, the, you, people are in power positions. So, they could be really nice to you, or they could be real jerks. I've experienced both of it. My wife was like the rock during all of this. I come home and be like deflated. I was wearing a suit a lot to work, which was more business casual, and everyone thought I was interviewing. So I'm like, are you interviewing? I'm like, no, I'm not. Like, I was like, if I told them I'm raising money for a restaurant chain, they'd be like, okay, sure, that's because out of his mind. And I told them that. They were just like, okay. Um, yeah, and then the 94th guy, a guy named David Robkin, who, uh, you probably know Steven Star Restaurants in Philadelphia. Sure. So David's partners with Steven. Um, he was involved with Steven since the first Budokan in the 90s. And I met David through, uh, I pitched an attorney. He goes, I might know a guy I play tennis with. I pitched David, and David is a VC and accountant by trade. Great guy, and he's just like, yeah, you know what? Like, you wanna create one concept versus Steven's 40. Steven's a genius, I'm not. I can do one and scale it. And he's like, that's great. Um, probably can get this funded. I'm like, holy shit. So that was 2000, April 2011. So you talked about, you alluded to this idea of, of the Green Bowl up here on campus or giving the idea. How about just overcoming the uncertainty around this notion that like another restaurant chain, really? Yeah. You know, how did you sort of overcome that, the, the lack of novelty of this idea of another place to go and eat? Not to mention just the tremendous difficulty. I mean, I think for everyone that can think of a restaurant chain that they know, they can also think of a vacant building where there used to be a restaurant chain they used to know. Well, that's absolutely right. So when I was a pre, I would see the sales information for the various tenants. So you know, Salad Works was doing gangbusters back in the day at Cherry Hill Mall. Chick-fil-A would always do great no matter where it was. And then you had brands like the Apple Store doing crazy numbers compared to Anchors. And I was like, okay, there's something about really great brands. Uh, Chipotle was beginning to really blow up and their numbers are through the roof compared to say to Qdoba. So I was like, what is it about creating a great brand that you can scale that's different? So I didn't want to be a Mexican concept. I didn't want to be a burger concept. I didn't want to be another salad concept. You know, we sell for every I think it's 80% stir fry to 20% salad. So really more of a stir fry company. Um, and I didn't want to do what's been done. So thinking about what's gonna, what is it gonna take for you to walk past someone else to come to us? And it's gotta be different. We gotta be able to do two day parts, seven day a week traffic, which you know, fortunately the model does. We talk about two day parts. Can you, can you unpack that for us? Yeah, so there's lunch and dinner. There's technically three. There's lunch, mid, for, in our world, lunch, mid, and dinner. We're, you know, call it just for lunch and dinner, we're about 40% lunch to 60% dinner, dinner being five to close at 1030. And so you have this idea, you're pitching all these investors, you know, it only takes one yes, yeah. right? But when you walked out of that 93rd pitch of a no, were you still amped to do 90, number 94? And how long were you in the trajectory? You said you gave yourself three years to get funded. 08 to 2011, how late into that cycle were you before you got that 94th yes? Yeah, so if I, if I started the process at the beginning of 2009, I was you know, two years and three months in. Wow. So I had you know, nine months to go. So I was really, in the beginning, you're full of like, yeah, I got this, and you'd be like, yeah. And then by that point in time, you just become really calloused. But the good is like, you really begin to know the questions and you gain confidence. Like, I remember the first time I pitched somebody, I was just like, I got this idea, and the guy's like, speak up. And I'm like, <laughs> He goes, how much money do you need? I'm like, $500,000. He's like, kid, that's not enough money. I'm like, okay. I, I was like, like nervous. And then by the time I got to like 90, 91, I was just like, we need a million dollars. I raised the number. We need a million dollars. Here's how we're going to do it. Here's where we're going to go. And like that confidence was key in, in raising capital. So 
Um, I was tired, for sure, and I think I, I probably would have made it to the end of the year, but I think December 31st, 2011, I would have been done. I'm like, that's it. So you get your first yes. Yeah. Check for a million dollars? It was him, he brought another individual on, and uh, yeah, together everyone raised a million bucks. So a million dollars literally hits your bank account, all released at once, the company's bank account? No, well first it was a $20,000 check, which was like insane, and then it was, I don't remember, I think it might have been tranched, but either way, I remember seeing the bank account going, oh my God, and I'm nuts with this stuff, so I'd make sure I was accounting for every penny, there's no questions, like, super transparent. I mean, even today, like we do an annual audit, I want everyone to know, like this is, we do monthly P&Ls, like, I think it's really key for business, like to be transparent and to show like what you're doing. Um, and I think pretty quickly I gained the trust of my partners and uh, it's off to the races, man. It was like, you know, we're doing this stir fry salad concept, now I gotta do it. Like it was all a business plan, now it's like real. <laughs> so that was my next question. So did you have any proof concept, any, any sort of kitchen showcase, or did you have anything that you were using to entice investors or it was literally just a piece of paper with a business plan? Yeah, so. Any food samples? <laughs> nothing, I, it was, I, I call it per shirt. Like, like it was really like fate almost. So. Um, I worked in a restaurant on the weekends in Washington, D.C. for a buddy of mine at the time, and I just learned back of house and cooking and everything else. Um, I paid for architectural renderings of what it would look like, and I was trying to say, like, it's kind of like this concept and this concept and this concept, and I would bring people to those places so they could understand it and see it and taste noodles. And, like, we buy the same noodles as David Chang at Momofuku. Like, it's a really high-quality product. I mean, and they're proprietary to us. It's a fresh-made egg white noodle, fresh-made whole wheat noodle. And I think once they started getting an understanding of it, they took the risk and said, I get it. Um, we'll do one urban, one suburban. So we did 16th Street, Center City, Philadelphia, and we did uh, Ballack Inwood. So you've got two locations that started at once, once in an urban environment, once in a suburban environment. And out of the gate, what were, I mean, I'm sure there's a million things that you learned in that, in that initial startup phase, but what were some of your, when you reflect back on it, your biggest takeaways, when you actually now had a physical restaurant space that you're running, versus when you're just sort of thinking this as an idea, what were one or two things that went either really well that you were surprised by, or one or two things that went really, really poorly where you had to really pivot super quick? Yeah, I mean, I never really ran a restaurant at the end of the day. <laughs> so I remember we opened up, I hired a GM, um, probably not the right GM, hanging out with staff after work, found inappropriate videos of her, which my staff did. I mean, just problems. Uh, my wife gave birth to her second daughter three weeks into it. Um, I remember the day we opened, this is classic, the day we opened, uh, we couldn't handle the volume. Like it just, we got slammed and I had team members just walking up the line saying, F this, I don't want to be a part of it. We couldn't service customers. Air conditioning broke in the middle of June. Um, it really sucked and I remember going home to my wife, I'm like, I may have made the biggest mistake of my life. And I called my partners the next day and I'm like, guys, like, Saturday, we're closing for Saturday, we're reorganizing, catching up on prep, we, we're gonna figure this out. They're like, what are, like what? And they for sure worry, like what the hell's going on? And then day by day, we started getting better, and more confident. So we opened the second location seven or eight months later, I ran it, I knew what I was doing, I felt comfortable with it, and that one took off from day one. So you had these, you had these early learnings on the first location, you sort of iron the kinks out when you get to the second location, how about you know your own passion for food? I mean, were yeah. you were you a foodie? Were you really into it? Did you like working in the restaurant? You know, so you hear from one single location restaurateurs that the trap of the restaurant is the hours are horrible, the work is really grueling, and you got to wake up and do it all again the next day. Right. Did you were you concerned at all that you might get trapped actually operating in this business as opposed to on the business? For sure, and I operated in the business for the first three years. I mean, I was basically GM, DM, running the restaurants, designing the restaurants, developing the restaurants. Fortunately, today we have a great team of people to be able to do that. Um, I love the food business. I mean, it's a passion. As a kid growing up in New York, like I would, you know, name a bagel place, we would go to it. Name a pizza place. Like we weren't really going to cool, fancy restaurants in Manhattan. We were doing more like the places in Brooklyn and Queens. Like, but there's something really soulful about that and beautiful. And if I couldn't be in the music business. Um, this to me is as good. And I figured this is my passion. And you gotta like, I tell some entrepreneurs all the time, like you gotta be good at something and really love it because you know this, like you're gonna go through like horrible peaks and valleys. Like it's just inevitable. It's like, you know, there's no straight line of success. And when the lows are low, they're low. And you gotta be able to like take it the fuck up and go. Like you gotta be like, all right. And, and for me, the passion of the food business and hospitality, um, when we have customers coming in and they're having a good time and I could talk to them, hey, how's it going? Like, I love that. I love like the food aspect of it, the team aspect of it. I mean, for me, it's, it's where I should be. 
So you're up to 40 locations now? 41, yes. 41 locations. <laughs> we went to print with 40, so now we got to okay. update that. Yes. We're growing so fast, we can't keep up. That's a, that's a theme here on Data Disrupt. We, <laughs> Good. Our, our data is normally stale, not because we're not doing the research, but because the businesses are growing so rapidly. So you're at 41 locations. What's really fascinating is you also have made social impact an mm -hmm. important part of your message. Can you talk about the importance of the business in terms of connecting the communities in which you serve and how you really take that through to your employees and, and all aspects of community? Yeah, I mean, we do a lot. I'm actually on the board of a nonprofit called Team Impact, which works with kids who, when they're leaving hospitals, are getting some sort of treatment. It's kind of like after you're in the hospital, what then? And uh, partner with a lot of NCAA teams. I believe Penn State's a part of it. Um, every dollar for every kids menu meal that we sell goes to Team Impact. So we raised a six-figure number for them last year. Um, we, we partnered with a ton of stuff in Philadelphia, various markets. We do fundraising out of every one of our restaurants. Um, you have to integrate yourself in the community where you operate or you won't come off as part of the community. Simple as that. I think it's one of the reasons we're successful. Like, if we just open up shop and act like we're the, the thing, like the cool people, like no one's going to buy into you. Like you've got to give back. It's key. And how about the profile of the location itself physically? So one of the things I've noticed is in certain locations, you know, the building can be in a really striking um, type of architectural profile. Yeah. Can you talk about how that sort of the style and design piece is played into community integration, but also being potentially a beacon for people to be attracted to? For sure. I mean, we want to be a best of brand. And I think, it, like, what you see is what you get. And we want people to see, like the King of Prussia Town Center location, I don't know how I got it so early on, but I mean, that really put us on the map, especially in the Philadelphia suburbs. But then you have Radnor, which is, you know, more of an inline space, not on the main road, but does phenomenally well. So we look for really great co-tenants, uh, you know, Wegmans Anchor, Target, those kind of guys, preferably NCAP, pad site, but you want something that, I mean, the, we, we actually did a market survey with about 3,000 people. People find out about us not from social media. So, you know, I'll take that guy left. Um, social media isn't the way people find out about us. It's actually people driving past the stores. So we need highly visible sites for people to discover, oh, what's that Honeyger place, stir fry? Well, let me check it out. Like, that's honestly how we drive most of our business. And, and you have to because you're a new brand, you're a nascent brand, yeah. and so you're not known to everyone. Um, are, do you eat the food yourself? And, and have, is, is, it, is it healthy? Should we, how should we be thinking about it? Sure. So I, I find it nutritious and um, as healthy as you want to make it. So our whole wheat noodle, 7 grams of fiber, 17 grams of protein, better, better than a quinoa bowl, toss your vegetables in there. But if you get a Cobb salad, it's going to be like 1,000 calories. So, you know, it's delicious and it's a really good product, but like the blue cheese, the bacon, like calories are there. So I tend to do my, uh, create my own stir fry. I do the freshly made egg white noodles. They're awesome. I do uh, light spicy garlic sauce. Sauces are awesome. Uh, pineapple, broccoli, edamame, and turkey meatballs. That tends to be my go-to. And in terms of the, what have you learned about managing people and what sort of cultural things have you brought to your team to uh, you know, go from where you were when you started, where yeah. it was so difficult and people were walking off the line, to now feeling a sense of empowerment among the people that work for you. Yeah, you know, my, my leadership style totally changed the years. I think it's really key, and, and you're in the same position. Like, you really want to continue to better yourself as a leader. Um, my job now is to continue to build more leaders. That's one of the key things, and instilling that way of thinking into my team. Um, I have a great team. I like to think they're empowered. I, you know, when I, like, do your thing. Like, I don't care how you get there. Like, get there, and you figure that out. But we work together on the KPIs and what the goals are. Um, but I really enjoy working with smart people, and yeah. Well, in a minute, we're going to open up to our audience for questions, but what does the future hold for Honeygrow? As you sit here today with 41, not to be confused with 40 locations, <laughs> and rapid growth, you're now out of the kitchen yourself, no longer running the daily operation, but really working on the business as opposed yep. to in the business. What does that future look like for you? How do you, what do you see when you look out? Yeah, I mean, uh, we're opening a total of 15 restaurants this year. Um, we're continuing that 30%, 35% growth rate annually. Um, and we're at, we're at an inflection point. You're actually having a board conversation now about it. You know, one of my investors owns called a big chunk of Five Guys Corporate. Um, and then Five Guys found a lot of success with franchising. Um, you know, our model is very complex. It's not flipping burgers, it's not peeling potatoes. Um, it's a lot harder to franchise, in my opinion, but we're exploring it. And or do you self-fund it with some debt, or do you continue to go down the road we're going, get you know the right private equity group involved with us, and then you know pull, do a COVID, did an IPO it. So 
exploring all those avenues for the long term, but you know, they're all exciting. Really neat. When you're when you bring your family into the restaurant and your kids come in and you know you've you know they've gotten a little older in age, what are, what do they tell you that excites them about the restaurant? What are they usually selecting? Yeah, so my, so my wife's actually the number one loyalty member in the company. Like bizarre, but they're getting it probably four times a week. Uh, my wife's just super nuts with food and she knows where it's coming from, so it's good. Uh, they're getting stir fries and salads. My kids uh, tell their teachers, like Honey Grow is well known where we are. So my kids will tell their teachers, oh my dad's the founder of Honey Grow and I think they're just trying to get like good grades or something. <laughs> so, you know, they leverage it um, <laughs> and good for them. So yeah, nah, it's all good. <laughs> now I have to ask the question, well, I'm gonna let the audience ask questions in a minute, but I have to ask the question that all audience members wanna know. Is there a state college office location, or state college location coming, and if so, when? So I'm looking at two sites while I'm here. Um, at the earliest, it'll be the end of next year. At the earliest. Well, whoever your host is for the Penn State visit, we're gonna make sure you don't actually leave the zip code until that location has been identified. One is very close to right here, so I'm trying. Very cool. Thank you. Great. Well, now we're gonna open up to audience questions, and we have a mic that we're gonna pass around, and your chance to really ask Justin any questions ranging from his entrepreneurial journey to his Penn State journey to anything about the business Honey Grow as well? Hi, my name is Daniel, and uh, I first interacted with Honey Grow on the City Line Avenue location. Yeah. Um, lovely spot. It is exactly the way you marketed it, it's exactly the way I stumbled upon it. It's kind of like, oh, wait, what is this place? Yeah. Um, <laughs> But I, I do have a, just a foodie type of question. Here. Sure. Um, have you thought about the inclusion of fish within your menu? Yeah, we, we've, we have shrimp, obviously. Um, we have a lot of people wanting us to do tilapia. And it's just, you want to limit the amount of SKUs you have. It's one of the challenges with the model. We have 85 SKUs on the menu. So I think fish becomes a bit more challenging. It's tougher to keep fresh. Um, if I can't do it, great. I don't, I don't want to do it. I, I worry about fish. Other questions? Hi, my name is Alex. I just had a question. So looking back like at everything that you've accomplished so far in your lifetime, like what would you tell like yourself near like your whatever your back if we're back at like I don't know when you were pitching, like your first starting pitches, your first few whatever, what would you like tell yourself then if you could like look back and go to that moment? Nothing. <laughs> no, gotta go through it. <laughs> Nothing. You, you gotta just keep moving forward in life. I've learned that. Like, it just there's a lot of ups and downs. You just gotta keep going. Hi, I'm Nathan. I'm curious if you have a favorite or most impactful book that you read about business along your journey. Oh man, I I'm a big I don't know if you are a big book person. Um, there's a lot. I actually finally read Phil Do uh, Shoe Dog by Phil Knight earlier this year, which is super great. Like, I always recommend that for entrepreneurs looking to start out. Um, one that's way more complex, but I thought was really interesting, was Robert Moses' book by, uh, what's his name, uh, Caro, which, again, like, what I liked about that book was how difficult it is to build things. Um, what is the name of that book? Power what is it? The Power Broker. Power Broker by Robert Caro, exactly. So it's about Robert Moses. I mean, he was a very controversial figure for many reasons, and, um, I mean, he plowed through neighborhoods with expressways and parkways and totally destroyed neighborhoods but it's a fascinating book on a guy who just got things done and not always in the most ethical way, which is horrible. Um, but New York City wouldn't be what it is today, for better or for worse. And just very, very interesting uh, book that I read a long time ago. Uh, hi, my name is Brad. Um, you sound like a family man. I'm just curious. Uh, with 41 locations, what's your travel schedule like? Or how, yeah. often, how, like how often are you home? Kind of I don't know. <laughs> uh, well, I'm here the next two days. Uh, next week, Boston. So, I mean, I'm usually home three to four nights a week on average. Uh, with the openings that we have, we're in seven different markets from DC to Massachusetts to Pittsburgh. And we're doing Ohio this year as well. Any Ohio, Cleveland people here? Still, you're from Ohio? Family of Cincinnati. <laughs> oh, Cincinnati, yeah. We're trying to get there. Um, a lot, and it's a balance. And you know, look, I always tell people like, make sure your spouse is supportive. I'm um, fortunate mine is. And and by the way, that's part, partially why we live in Philadelphia because my in-laws are there. And like, if I'm not home and she needs support, she's got it, and they're great.
grab me. Um, I was curious, you talked a lot about how this came to be, and how you got kind of this storyline source. Mm -hmm. Are there any other um, challenges that you faced along the way that you can talk about if there's been, you know, some stores that weren't as successful in their locations and had to close, or if there's been any other, you know, stories that we can we can learn from your, from your failures as well as your A lot of, lot of mistakes. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you quick. I mean, we, the first like 13, 14 restaurants that we opened were extraordinarily successful. And when you have so much success so early, you tend to just get arrogant. Without even realizing, you just become overconfident. So we raised too much capital, in my opinion, too early. And uh, we had the pressure to grow, 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 grow really quickly. So. We wound up doing in 2016, signed a bunch of leases in Chicago, in Pittsburgh, in Boston, Baltimore Metro, DC Metro, New York, and I wanted to do a second concept called Mini Grow, which would be a smaller footprint version of Honey Grow, easier to do. And simultaneously, with all this capital we raised, we hired this big fancy corporate team, so the GNA skyrocketed, and the cost to build the Honey Grows were still really high, which is why I wanted to create that second concept, Mini Grow, to kind of alleviate that. Um, it was like you read a business textbook of everything never to do, and I did that. Uh, and so by 2017, we opened all this up. 2018, running out of cash, and we had raised a lot of capital. And I'll never forget, like, I was on vacation with my wife in Miami, and she's on the phone with my kids, and I'm on the phone with my CFO, and my CFO is just like, we have a board meeting in two weeks, and we're gonna declare bankruptcy. That's it, we're, we're calling it a day. Justin, we're not gonna get out of these leases. We had this weird bifurcation where the new markets weren't taking off and the older markets were doing unbelievably well. So this weird bifurcation and it was just sucking cash. So tough board meeting, you know, laid out a plan, the investors were supportive. Um, basically said like, look, like we're gonna reduce the GNA, we're gonna stop growth, we're gonna close Chicago, it's a bridge too far, and we're gonna drive sales and profit. And 2019, we made some big changes on the P&L, without ever reducing quality. That was kind of like key. Like how do we better manage the business? How do we get the construction costs down? How do we write, make the right model to scale? And you know, we have a, I have an awesome group of people that work with me and you know, they did it. <laughs> so they really figured out like, well, you know, our CEO Walt, he's also a Penn State guy, Walt Harkin shout out. He really, you know, did a great job. Give him a round of applause. <laughs> Penn State engineer guy. Uh, he actually was formerly five below head of their development who I, I poached, but uh, he, um, he figured out with his team how to like take something, take this thing from a $1.3 million cost and get it below a million bucks. And then the returns really made sense. In our, in our world, you need a two to one sales to investment ratio. You need a less than a two year payback and you want above a 20% for well profit for every restaurant. And you know, we all work our butts off to get there. And there's a lot of people I don't have time to mention, but you know who I'm thinking of you and I love you. I mean, the team really stepped up. They did an unbelievable job in their own way. So 2020, we're ready to rock. Things are better. March, uh, by August 2020, we were actually doing okay. We, we leaned into third-party delivery, DoorDash, Uber Eats, kind of saved our butts. It was 8% prior to the pandemic, and then became 45%, and we survived. And then uh, since, since stopping the engine of growth and then restarting it in 2020, we've opened 18 locations and they're outperforming all the other ones. So that breather, I tell people who want to grow fast, like make sure you really nail down what you have. Um, because I think we had a false positive in the beginning. Justin, can we talk through some of that? Yeah. So let's just unpack that a little bit. So really incredible, um, and credit to Heather for an amazing question. So you've got this experience where what you're doing is working and every marginal dollar before you expand outside of the region, every, every marginal dollar you're investing is showing you a marginal return and you're feeling really good about it. So as you sort of, ex but you've also got this pressure, this crush, if you will, of all these dollars. And so just to kind of pack it for our listeners, if you have too much dollars and you're not putting them out into the businesses, the return on investment of those dollars is not high enough, even though your actual units per unit is actually performing Exactly well. right, yeah. So you say, okay, I've got all these dollars, I, I'm forced to expand. When you expand to a place like Chicago, and actually just, uh, funny you mentioned that, because I literally was on a flight once sitting next to someone 
who was actually responsible for expanding Honey Grove into Chicago. I remember Oop. thinking. Oh my God, I wonder who it was. <laughs> I, remember, I remember thinking at the time, like, wow, that's a Pennsylvania based company. <laughs> what are you doing in Chicago? <laughs> so, Surviving, can, you just, can you just talk for a moment about, you know, the fact that the, that the idea didn't kind of have any, didn't have the same degree of uptake there, or the concept, I should say, didn't have the same degree of uptake there. What lessons did you learn from that that you're now applying as you go into Ohio or further south into Maryland and yeah. D.C. where you're getting beyond that sort of word of mouth footprint in Pennsylvania? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, look, we're, we're opening Ohio. It's our first new market since 2018. So in, in what is that, six years. So, excuse me. So there's a lot of, you know, anxiety and concern. What we're doing differently is evaluating where we're going. Start there. So. In Chicago, I don't know how familiar with Chicago you are, but we were in the West Loop, we were in the Loop, and we were in Schaumburg, which was like the middle of nowhere compared to you know the middle of Chicago. Um, really understanding, uh, to your point about construction costs, negotiating with the landlord to make sure we can get the right deal for us. If we can't pencil it out, we don't do it. Uh, we see a lot of publicly traded other fast casuals taking deals that are crazy in terms of rent and lack of you know TI check or whatever. Let them take it, and that's totally okay. Like we are really disciplined on the deals that we're doing and willing to do and willing not to do. Um, so that's part one. Part two is the co-tenancy. So again, thinking about Chicago and some other sites that didn't work out, um, you know, not having an anchor, not having the ability for two day parts, not having not having the right visibility. If we don't have that and the right demos, we just don't do it. So we'll see some really awesome real estate corner end cap whatever. Rent's going to be two hundred forty thousand dollars a year. We're not going to take it. So a good example is Boston. Boston's our best market for sales. Period. I mean, it just crushes it up there. We love it. We're very happy. We took those deals. The rents are astronomically high. We have great GMs. They figured out how to make it work. But all of the other sites that we look at, it's crazy. So as as well as we do in Boston, it doesn't matter how high the rent is. It's like fine. We're not willing to take that risk, and just being very disciplined in that process. So. You mentioned uh, no ability for two-day caps. So you're talking about certain locations where you maybe can stay open, but there's not enough foot traffic to support that second leg of the sales. Yeah, because you, like again, like think about a supermarket. Like if you have a powerful like Wegmans, like people are going to come, you know, probably in the morning, and they'll come back maybe at six o'clock after work or whatever. That means that we will be seen twice and on weekends. Versus, you know, I'm trying to think of a good example, Chicago, like West Loop, you know, like. No one was really going for lunch, but like they'd come there for a night. So sometimes they go for dinner, but there was so much competition in that market, it didn't really make any sense. Conversely, in the loop, people were going for lunch, but they weren't going for dinner. So again, that, that two-day part is so key. So as you think about the, the way that, that office populations are migrating away from in-office downtown mm -hmm. urban areas to more work from home, work remote, how is that influencing your real estate decisions on where you're actually deciding to put future business or future sites? Yeah, I mean, we are we switched to a suburban model full time in 2018 before the pandemic, so we've been just like happy with it. Now everyone jumped into the bandwagon, so rents are going up. Um, but I mean, it's still like we're looking at markets where we know we can drive both of those those day parts. Also, we do about 36 percent third party delivery, so. You, know, you might be home and you're going DoorDash. We want to make sure the picture looks beautiful. It's not just an overhead bull shot like everybody else. Like, we want you to be like, oh, we call it a thumb stopping moment. Like, oh, cool. Like, that noodle pool looks really good. I want that. Like, so, again, like 36% of our business coming from Uber Eats, Grubhub, and DoorDash um, has it changed our real estate strategy? Not really, but we're getting a little bit more bullish thinking about does it need to be that you know, highly visible site for that rent? Maybe you can go a little bit next to it, pay a fraction of the rent. And still do as well with third party, so we'll, we'll test it out. What are your? You mentioned the food delivery. I mean, food delivery model has gone through a dramatic a degree of changes. Obviously, it was an explosive business yeah. during the pandemic. It's now sort of starting to trail off. People have questioned the unit economics of whether that model is viable. And then also, there's the profit sharing in terms of using the rider. Can you talk about how the economic model works for you in terms of delivery and anything you've had to do different? In terms of SKUs offer or anything else yeah. to be able to drive the right traffic at the right margin for that part of your business? Yeah, great question. I mean, we, we have a premium price on there, so there's a, there's a markup on that. Um, it's the only way it's going to work for us, and really for anybody, because they're taking about anywhere from 20 plus percent of your profit margin or of your sales. So that's 20 percent is your profit. So um, we do we do a 20 percent markup on it, and we tested that four and a half years ago, thinking like people are going to push back, and no, people. I think a lot of folks are understanding of that and they get it. Um, we really work hard to make sure that we can, you know, the product will be good when you get it. I always, I, like, I always worry, like, if you're not eating it at the restaurant, it just simply won't be as good. It, it's pretty good in the container that we have, but 
if there's a problem, for example, we've had DoorDash drivers just drop the food off and smoke a cigarette on someone's porch, and then people watch it in the ring, and then they kind of like, why is your driver doing this? It's a bad reflection on the brand. So there's a lot of good and bad, but really there's way more good. I mean, if not for those third-party companies, we wouldn't have survived the pandemic, period. And 2021, like, I'll never forget, like 2020, everyone was afraid to get food. Like, I was out there throughout the pandemic. I somehow didn't get COVID until 2022. But I remember like in the beginning, everyone's like, I don't want to order food, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get coronavirus, which was what we were calling it back then. So, you know, I think that the third party thing saved us, people weren't leaving their homes, and amazingly, it's still 36% of our business. Incredible. So as you think back to that period, you had this, this growth scare in 2018 yeah. with respect to the way you were expanding as you're retrenching and getting over that, then the pandemic hits. Right. I mean, some of those early days, I mean, what were you thinking in terms of the viability of your business? We were, you know, the whole country was going through a, a lot of, of self-reflection and concern over that time, but you're a business owner on top of it, of running a family and all that other stuff. We, I, I just, we just got out of the whole, like we're almost lights out in <laughs> 2018. Like, so we were already kind of like veterans and survivors that were just like, oh, like tired. So when I remember like Trump went on like, all the announcements were made, like NBA was canceled. We were like, this is real, oh my God. Like, we went to work on Friday. I um, remember my kids didn't have school that Friday. And um, we sat there and we, we thought like, what could we do to keep this business alive? Do we wanna stay open? Our team, we, all the restaurant team members were like, we need the job. Like, we're willing to just be out there and get this. Like, we need to work. So we, we said fine. And we figured out how much cash we had left, trying to find debt from anyone that would give it us so we can actually stay afloat. And fingers crossed that the government would do something. So when the PPP thing came out, it saved our business, period. It was great. Well, it's one of those things where until you've actually been to the brink, you yeah. don't really know how strong you are. I imagine in some ways living through 2020 and then figuring out the playbook of how to survive was probably not unlike talking to your 93rd investor yeah. at that point in terms of having to raise money. You know, it's interesting thinking back on a question that was asked earlier about what comments or advice would you have for your, your earlier self? And you said, you know, nothing. Basically, just go out and do it. Yeah. Um, I, I think that really speaks to your resilience of what you're trying to achieve. Is, for anybody that's thinking about starting a business, yeah. for anybody that has the desire to be a founder, but maybe they don't yet have the idea or the concept, um, what, what advice would you have for them? I love this question, and I always get the same answer, take accounting 101. <laughs> Seriously. Like, that. It just... <laughs> Like, I think a lot of times people think about being an entrepreneur and just like you get to have your cup of coffee with a laptop and that's it. Like, honestly, like, that's crazy. <laughs> like, to, to be an entrepreneur, look, I mean, profit or nonprofit, like, you need to understand the way a business works. And so when you can understand, like, the income statement and the difference of cash flows and your balance sheet, you really begin to understand things a bit better. Like, I remember, like, my, my dad and my grandfather, they ran the business with knowing how much money was in the account. Like that was the old school way. It was like, okay, we got this in the account. We got to get this check, this check, this check. You know, Jeff, make the phone calls, my grandfather would say. So like my grandfather would make the calls. Whereas like if you can budget and understand that and you have KPIs and goals that you can work towards and you can understand, you know, accounts receivable, money coming in and the difference of accounts receivable and cash flow, you really begin to have a bit of an edge. And I always coach people like, I get it, you want to do this, but understand the absolute basics of business, which is accounting 101. Which by the way, I took here and got a D because I didn't show up. <laughs> and so when I went to Temple, they're like, you have okay grades, but you got this D in accounting. And I was like, yeah, so I had to retake it and I got an A, but it was, when I actually like applied myself to it, I found it very interesting. So I think it also just speaks to this idea that when you actually find whatever your purpose or calling might be, there, the will to, to, to really go above and beyond really comes out as well. For sure. Love it. Well, thank you, Justin, for taking the time to share your entrepreneurial journey with us. That was Justin Rosenberg, founder and CEO of HoneyGrow. This episode was produced and edited by Katie DeFiore. And if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to Dare to Disrupt wherever you listen to podcasts and look out for next month's episode. Thanks everyone for listening and for those in the room, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Yeah, yeah.